But with that, I just want to uh, invite you to come on in and uh, uh, look at what we have today. If you don't have a handout, I always say this, I sound like a broken recording when I do say it, but if you don't have a handout, shoot your hand up into the air. And Jim in the back probably has some more handouts. Do you or do, do you not? If you just want to uh, raise your hand, if you do not have a handout, we'll get you, uh, we'll get you uh, on your way. And I can't find my glasses. Are my glasses somewhere over there? Yes. Thank you. Sign of aging, you know, when you need, when you need uh, reading glasses. Wow, okay. So as you can see on your outline, we are looking at uh, Christian doctrine basics, and we're looking at class number four, introduction to uh, creationism. That has a lot to do with uh, the book of Genesis chapter one and two, but we're going to be looking at other parts of our Bible as well. Uh, just by way to, uh, to mention this as well, too, uh, Greg Beerbaum, who is sitting at my, my left here, uh, he did a stellar, awesome job at uh, unfurling everything that has to do with science as it relates to biblical creationism. And so I believe his notes are online in, in PDF form, so if you want to look those up, if you didn't catch everything he said, um, they are available online, and the video is, is available as well for that. So what I'm going to be doing here is a, is a little bit of what Greg did last time, but I'm going to be doing a, just a little bit, tad bit more, uh, getting into just uh, the ways that people think about uh, biblical creationism and, and, and how we, what is, what is the, the goal of this discussion too. I think it's also good just not just to talk about the minutia, uh, the, the details of our created order that is around us, but where is this all going? Is there a shepherding direction that this is going in? And uh, you're going to see uh, in a moment here that there is, in fact, uh, a tie-in to even the, things, the thing behind me, the cross as well, too, the cross of Jesus Christ and how it weighs in and how the book of, of Genesis relates to even the things of the cross, the things of Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 5. So we'll get in, into that in a minute. But at the very top there, you can see what we're looking at, the uh, class 4 is Introduction to Creationism. And the purpose statement is, is, is the same as before. Uh, it is to refine the categorical, categorical, if I can say that correctly, the categorical or topical way that we understand the scriptures, uh, not just for the sake of knowing the Bible, but it is, it is for the purpose, the central purpose as, of us being in conformity to Christ. So this is, a, this is something that is meant to get between our ears, but it also is to reach our heart in Christ Jesus as well. And with that, I want to just uh, launch into our time and uh, look at the first question there, or the first thing that is uh, needful for us to kind of understand about uh, creationism, and that's what we mean by biblical creationism. So I need to explain this at the forefront just to get you acquainted with uh, the, the discussion that goes around creationism. Uh, there are a total of three major views concerning creationism in the Bible. And uh, I'll say generally they're all represented by, represented by uh, Christians who believe in uh, salvation through the cross. Uh, but when it gets into the details, I would say uh, some of those professing believers, some of those professing Christians actually, I believe, veer off rather significantly and so I'm going to just articulate this. This is not in your outline at the forefront. I'm just going to articulate this for you. Is the first view is what's called theistic evolution. Uh, theistic evolution uh, believes that in everything you hear from the public school system about evolution, except they put it under the rubric of God is sovereign. So uh, the theistic evolutionist who's a professing believer, who's a professing Christian, would say that... As I look at you and you look at me, I would say your ancestors were apes. And you would look at me and you would say your ancestors are, were apes. By the way, when you say that, you also have to say something else. You have to say that Jesus Christ, his ancestors were apes as well too. So that's a little, <laughs> that's a wrinkle <laughs> in, in that argument as well to say that Christ, in, in some ways, he is also from an ape. Or, or uh, more appropriately, I think they would say a chimpanzee, a chimp. Um, but they would, say, they would say that under the rubric of theism, that God is sovereign. So God uh, made uh, people come from apes and made things come out of the ground and turn into life, turn into biology. And it's all under God's design. He, he made it that way. And you just have to work with how God is working with science. 
uh, and how they go about the Bible with the book of Genesis, and you can imagine where this is going to go, it's all allegory. It's all just a sort of a, a motif, uh, a sort of a, uh, a mythical tale, uh, but it doesn't have any literal substance to it, uh, prima facie at face value. So that is the view of theistic evolution. The second view is what we might call old earth creationism. Old earth created Creationism uh, does not necessarily believe, does not believe that we came from apes, but it does believe that uh, there were gaps and that yom, the word for day in the Hebrew is yom, and that those days were not 24-hour days. They were very, lo very long eons of time, uh, maybe millions and millions of years in one quote-unquote day. And so uh, they would uh, weigh in heavily when it comes to uh, measuring the time that we see in rocks with uh, carbon-14 data. They would bank on that and say the carbon-14 data, as we see it, is right, and the Bible is not to be taken literally with regards to 24 hours because the earth cannot be that young because of the apparent age that we see embedded in the rock. That is the view of old earth creationism. The third one is the view that I take that I'm going to just kind of unfurl for you, and that is the view of young earth creationism. Young earth creationism is the view that takes uh, the Bible uh, quite literally. Uh, that doesn't mean that every single last verse is taken literally, but mostly, mostly, mostly it is taken literally. Uh, prima facie, that is at face value, God speaking plainly to the early Jews through Moses in the Torah and, and not in some kind of a mythical way. So it's, it's very much easily understood. And it's also understood under this way as well too. Is not God the God of miracles? I mean, uh, he speaks things into existence like a sovereign Lord. That's because he is the sovereign king of the universe. He speaks it into existence. That's exactly what God does. And we don't see that as something as, uh, you know, going back into the dark ages. Oh, you're, you believe in a God that believes in miracles? Uh, I, I mean, you believe in that big miracle stuff? Uh, that's like the dark ages. You must also as well, too, believe that the, the world is flat. I bet you're one of those people who believes the world is flat because you also believe that God created in six days. So easily when you come out and you say that you're a young earth creationist, some people can automatically categorize you as being very out of step with science in total. In fact, just almost turning a blind eye to what science has to say, say and going in the opposite direction. Now, I'm not going to repeat everything that Greg shared last time, but uh, I think the title of your, of your uh, lesson last time was biblical, biblical Creationism and was it True Science? True Science, true science right. So uh, there is no disparity or, 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 or gap, if I could use that word, word, between science and what the Bible says, where some, a lot of people... That's where they automatically, uh, with their skepticism, that's where they default on. So that's what we're looking at today is uh, why biblical creationism, and by that what I mean is YEC, young earth creationism, is a must. And you're going to see this more clearly as we go along. Number one, it determines how we interpret the Bible. This is a good argument to make. If you can't get Genesis 1 and 2 right... Uh, if you start out with the Bible being all allegory, it's all a mythical tale, well, you know, we're approaching Easter, Resurrection Sunday, who's to say that the empty tomb of Jesus Christ is allegory? It's a mythical tale. He didn't really rise from the, from the dead. He just kind of, his disciples became very triumphant in, in their legacy of his ministry, but he didn't literally come out of the grave. Uh, we, we, you know, that's, that's obviously taking uh, things uh, very unliterally, very much uh, like a mythical uh, story. So first of all, uh, when, we, when we open our Bibles, we must understand, I believe, uh, the Bible understood uh, mostly literally. And that, that is something not, that's not just for Genesis. It's also for many other passages of Scripture, most all other passages of Scripture, unless the Bible is explicit in saying that something is an allegory, like a parable is an allegory. Number one on the list there is Genesis chapter one begins with, in the beginning, God. And uh, I would ask you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter one, and I'm going to not read all 28 verses uh, that I wanted to read, but I'm going to try to read as much as I can in the, the brevity of time that we have. But it really gets us under, underway as far as understanding who God is. Uh, the fact of the matter is that nothing ex preceded God in any way, shape, or form. 
God owns his, uniform, his own universe. He spoke it into existence, and he is transcendent above it. God is not limited to space or time. And we see that very clearly in the first verse of Genesis chapter 1. Notice how here it does not tell you where God came from or how God was born. God always was, as his name is, Yahweh, I am. I've always existed. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called the, the darkness, he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Notice how it says evening and morning talking about a 24-hour period. Verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought Earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruits in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Now, onward, it talks about the lights, the expanse of heaven, uh, the things of, of night and day with regards to the sun and the moon and all that. I'm going to just kind of jump down and just bridge it uh, to the very end at verse 26. After uh, so much, God finally does his crowning achievement. His crowning achievement is the creation of Adam and Eve who oversee all of his created order. It says in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm going to stop there at that verse. Answer this question if you can. Does that sound constructive or destructive? Does that sound orderly or disorderly? It sounds, what? Orderly. Uh, It sounds, uh, it's in sequential order, one after the other. It's not something that is thrown together with things exploding in in your face. No, this is the God of order. This is a God who's sovereign. This is a God who's king over his universe. And he says, I'm going to make it happen, I'm going to call it out, and then I'm going to give it its name. I'm going to be show my sovereignty by saying, that, that thing over there, that's the sun. That thing over there, I'm pointing down because he's above it. <laughs> that thing down there, that's the moon. <laughs> um, he's above it all. And this, this is a wonderful thing to see how God is transcendent uh, above his created order, and he owns it all, and he declares it all. And he, he did not create uh, man and woman uh, to be like, ooh, 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 apes, you know, can't, you know, can't you know, do anything because I'm an ape, and I'm going to act like an ape, and I'm going to treat you like an ape because uh, we all come from disorder. This is just a little aside, but I, I grew up in the public school system, uh, L.A. Unified <laughs> School District, I'll have you know. And, um, yeah, <laughs> and I won't share everything that I saw there. Um, but one of the things I remember, one professor, I think it was a math teacher or something like that, he may have gone to church. Not many of my teachers went to church at all. They were mostly pagans. But one professor that I had, uh, he was complaining about the students. And he says, you know, we're, we're teaching them that they came from apes. And I noticed that, you know, 
my students are acting like apes. <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, there could be a connection, you know, between um, being teaching them that they come from apes and then acting like apes as well, too, acting barbaric. Maybe there is a connection there. Maybe that actually, uh, the heart receives that a certain way and it germinates in the heart and then produce, produces some really weird, bad things with regards to other people. So we just need to be aware of this. This is not just a mind issue. This is a heart issue as well. Uh, number two in your outline, literal six-day creationism, creationism, let me say that correctly, literal six-day creationism sets the pace for man copying God as our divine pace setter for the primary re- reason we, we exist. And you're going to say, whoa, whoa, what did he say? What's the primary reason we exist? To work. How many days are there in, in a week? Seven. Seven. How many are devoted to work? Six, not five, six. Now, some people say it's five days in the office, and then when I get home, I work on the house, fine, or whatever, you know. But, you know, over time, over the passage of time, that has generally been known to be uh, a, a workable argument. You know, that, you know when you get to the, the seventh day, whenever that is, that's the day you need to just kind of slow down and rest and catch your breath and don't go berserk. So lit- literal six-day creationism sets the pace for a man copying God as our divine pace setter, for the primary reason why we exist to work. By the way, I just want to put this in as well, too. You can work and worship at the same time. Uh, I know, not like the people do up here. Um, you don't want to hear me sing. I know that for sure. But, um, you know, while you're toiling away, you could say, Lord, thank you for giving me arms. Lord, thank you for giving me legs. Lord, thank you for giving me a mind that I can learn uh, an Excel program and, and do all these things on the screen or something like that or do something with the, the plow. Uh, yeah, we can give glory to God as we work. Uh, so the, the literal inter- interpretation of Genesis says that God can radically, uh, I'm jumping ahead here, number two, again, the literal six-day creationism sets the pace for man copying God. Uh, it's basically uh, the early Jew, uh, for the time of Moses, around Sinai, the early Jew would basically understand stand this. God, our Father, did this. He created in six days, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked. And you know what I'm going to do? When I'm here in Israel, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. I'm going to work because I'm reflecting. See, the imagery is right there. I'm reflecting God. I'm reflecting him. I reflect his glory. And that goes right in concert with verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. See, the the wonderful theology here is that God is not distant. You know, that's that's the fallacy of deism that says that God is like way, way out there. He's in a separate universe. In fact, he's several universes away from us. And he doesn't really care about you. He doesn't care about what you're doing in, in, in your private quarters or anything like that. He's far, far and away. Just, just throw him out of the argument, practically speaking. It's just the opposite in the Bible. No, he's very near to us. In fact, we copycat him as best we can because he's our father and we relate to him that way. Uh, Number three in your outline, I hope we get through all of this. Um, (laughs) The literal interpretation of Genesis says that God can radically weigh in on his universe at any time. And I would add to that, not just in Genesis, but also at the end of the Bible, which is called the book of Revelation, he could weigh in on the, the, the end of time as well, and he will. But the literal interpretation of Genesis says that God can just radically weigh in on his universe at any time, and that means he just sets it in order and then he starts giving instruction, and it's almost like, you know, I don't know if any of you have been in the military or something like that, you have a drill sergeant, and he's not waiting for things to happen. He's saying, today, today, make it happen. God could be very much like that, like a drill sergeant. I put things in order, everything's clean, everything's good, now get to work. Work that field. And that's all under the rubric of God's goodness. It's not God being austere or anything like that at all. Uh, the non-literal interpretation at the middle of your, 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 your outline there on number four, the non-literal interpretation of Genesis presents us with a God who cannot speak plainly. He's more like a mystic or a poet. I mean, imagine this for, for you. And This is just a scenario I thought of my, my own. I don't know if it's helpful or not. I'm going to try it on you right now. But um, imagine if you're a Jew living in the time of Moses. You know, you're in the wilderness, in the desert, you get the first edition of the Torah, pretty cool, right? And it's coming down from Moses, it's in written form. Maybe you have teachers around you who are teaching the Torah, the law of Moses, which begins, by the way, with Genesis. And you learn all this, you're scratching your head and you're saying like, you know, my parents came from 
Egypt, and they were slaves, and, and, and we were just like, you know, we were working like hard jobs and all these kind of things, and slaving away and being treated like animals, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm just kind of curious, where, where did we come from, you know? Where did we truly come from? Is it okay for an early Jew to ask that question who's around Moses? What if they were given the answer of, well, um, we won't tell you what really happened. We'll give you this story that you can enjoy while you struggle to survive in Israel or wherever you are. We won't tell you exactly substantively the substance of what really happened historically. We'll give you a sort of a glazed, overarching story. You know, if I was a Jew back then in the time of Moses, you know what I would say? Well, thank you for that story. But I have a, a real question, and I literally want to know, where did we come from? I mean, the story is great. I understand it has some high moments, and, you know, there's, you know, all of that. But literally, where did we, we that, would, that would be basically a question left, what, unanswered, uh, if you go with the allegorical interpretation. Just those, those Jews they don't need to know what really happened. We know what happened because we're so more advanced than them, knowing that we came from apes. But the, but the Jews back then, you know, uh, they didn't need to know the whole story. So we give them a story. So we give them a, an allegory. We give them a, a tale for them to kind of tuck away in their minds. That's just nonsensical. Uh, moving our way down on the uh, front of our outline as well, too, the second reason why biblical creationism is a must it, because it determines the reality of the gospel. I would invite you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to begin there. And, and Greg, Greg uh, Beerbaum, can I have you read Romans 5, 18 through 19, please? condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. So you see the, the, the theological construct there is that you have the one who committed the trespass. Now is that Jesus Christ or Adam? Which one is that? That's Adam. And it's, it's how many Adams? One, right? So one, Adam committed sin. Of course, there's Eve next to him. And of course, you know, involves more than that, obviously. But he's, he's more or less our federal head. He's the one who came first. He's representative of the human race. Uh, he commits sin. He is told not to eat of the forbidden fruit. He goes ahead and disobeys God. I mean, Eve is right there. His wife does it first. He does it second right next to her. Um, and then there, after that, the way it's unfurled in Genesis is there's a tailspin of, of human depravity. The first offspring of, the first offspring of uh, Adam was who? Uh, was it Abel? Cain. I thought Cain was the firstborn. Did I get the, it's all right. It's okay. It's all right. We, we, won't, we won't ding you if you get it wrong. But I believe, yeah, Cain's the firstborn. Then came Abel. The firstborn, uh, am I saying that right? Is, is Cain... Okay. I had a brain lapse there. Sorry. So Cain is first, right? Okay. Okay. This happens occasionally with aging. Uh, you feel like you're sometimes losing your mind up here. And I said, did I say that right? And then I have to say, yes, you did. You know, or something like that. So Cain is the firstborn. Who commits the first murder? Cain. It's okay. We're going to... It's still early. Some of us are morning people. Some of us are not. I'll have you know, I'm a morning person. But, uh, but yeah, it is not, uh, it is actually Cain is the firstborn, and he also commits uh, the first murder. So what you have there is a, a tailspin effect. It just goes down, 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 and is human depravity on display. And we see that, just going back to Romans chapter 5, we see that outright. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, referring to Jesus Christ, leads to justification and life for all men. So you can see there what's going on. Now, here's the scenario. I want you to look at this. Just, 
and, and let's not get all hung up about Cain and Abel here. Just, just look at the bottom of your outline, okay? Page, page one of four on the bottom there. Follow this logic. I'm going to basically unfurl before you the logic of theistic evolution, and I'm going to explain to you why it's a problem. And there are theologians who sometimes were slow in catching up on this, and eventually they got it, and they said, I understand now, we have a problem with, we have a huge problem with theistic evolution. Not a little problem, but a big problem. Number one, part B1, if, let's just take the scenario that, you know, there was not just one atom, but there's a whole row of little A atoms. All of them were being developed out of chimpanzees, out of apes. If Adam was surrounded by other evolving men, who, were, who were just became men or something like that, if Adam was surrounded by other evolving men, did those others avoid the curse put on him? And you would say, logically, yes. If it was just one, Adam, and he just got developed, you know, he's just, he, I should say, he just evolved into Adam, and he's now a man, in quotes, and he partakes of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, he sins, he sets everything in a tailspin, According to the theistic evolution, wait a second, there's not just one. There's a whole row of little A atoms over here. They've evolved, and then they've evolved, and then they've evolved some more. And so the curse comes on one, but then again, there's others that you're not considering here who did not sin like Adam sinned. Number two, if the, just stay with the logic here. Just, just hold on. If the flood was not global... Could those people groups not having Adam's curse, and they were not of his seminal line, if the flood was not global, could the people groups not having Adam's curse put upon him, could they keep on propagating? Oh, oh this is another wrinkle now. See, the theistic evolutionists don't believe in the global flood. They believe in a partial flood. It was, you know, maybe in a crater or something like that. But outside of that, there was no flood. And so reasonably, you could say there was a continuation of these little A atoms, you know, evolved now, and they're, they're having kids over here and over here. They're not part of that flood that comes in the time of Noah. And so their lives are spared. Adam starts, is, is, uh, his line is preserved only through Noah himself through the flood, but the others make it on the outside who don't have to experience the global flood. Here's the wrinkle. Here's the problem. Bottom of your outline, number three. If both one and two above are true, and I'm just playing the devil's advocate here, if both one and two are above are true, then the need for salvation only applies to those in the line of Adam, but not to those of the super race who don't need salvation at all because they're not related to Adam, because they survived it all. They survived the flood because it was partial. It wasn't global. They survived uh, the curse because they were next to Adam, but they were not of his loins. They were not of his line. So now you have a huge problem on your hands. You have, you know, when we do the Great Commission, send out those missionaries. Well, don't send them out to all the worlds. Make sure you just send out to them to the ones who are related to the first Adam. But the other evolved Adams, you know, maybe they're, they're not so bad and, and they, they don't have sin. Well, there is a huge problem right there, because look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says this, and it relates to everything here. It relates to the cross. It relates to creation. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, it says, all ungodliness. How many people commit ungodly acts in the world? All do. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has, made, has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks, give him thanks but they became futile in their thinking Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Hello? That, that describes the whole globe. That de describes de depravity around the globe uh, with, with exhaustively, without exception. The only exception you would say is Jesus Christ, who, by the way, uh, did not come from the loins of the man. Jesus Christ did not come from a seminal transmission. Jesus Christ came from the virgin birth. 
he's the only exception. But beyond that, everybody else is showing, myself included, showing the effects of sin in my body, in my mind. Uh, my mind needs to be cleaned up. My mind needs to be purged because of the things going on in my brain that are against God's holy law. Uh, that's not something that is exclusive to just those people, those bad people who are related to Adam, but the rest of us, we're, we're of the super race. We don't need salvation. No, all need salvation because all came from who? Adam, the one Adam of Scripture. So all of this ties together with the cross. It ties together with Romans chapter 1, other, books, other passages of Romans as well too. Uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means literally all have fallen short of the glory of God, all need salvation. And there is no, I'll say this again, there is no super race of little a Adams who did not suffer the effects of the curse because they themselves were far, far away from that forbidden tree. They didn't even know about it. I'm sorry, that doesn't, doesn't work that way. That's, that's going outside of the line of logic that we find in Scripture. Now, I've spoken a lot on that. Please. One other thing. Yes. Right. The Bible right. And you're putting yourselves above God, really. And, and is there not going to come a time when you, you have to pick and choose, right? There will come a time when a person says, well, and uh, I believe it's one of the present, I don't, I don't want to say this harshly, but I believe Jimmy Carter, who's a professing um, born again Christian, he's professing, uh, he'll, he'll say a lot of the things in Scripture are non literal. Jimmy Carter would. Except, I think, uh, <laughs> except for the resurrection. He stops there with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, well, I believe that's literal. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, Al Mohler interviewed him in person. On uh, Just look up almohler.com, and you will hear the interview that Al Mohler had with Jimmy Carter. It's very interesting. Very interesting. I, I be- Do you believe that the Bible is true? No, not totally. Mostly no. But except, you know, as long as I keep my Christian tag on, I'll say that the resurrection was true. And, uh, so, and this thing happens, by the way, what Larry is sharing here, it happens in Christian colleges as well. Uh, you will have professors that, 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 that say, in the name of intellectual freedom, let's keep it open. And what comes out of that is a bunch of students going like this. I thought I had a clean theology, but now it has all these ripples and hills and valleys that I have to leap over. And it just makes it hard, not easy, unnecessarily. Um, turn in your outline to, uh, thank you that, for that, Larry. Turn your outline to page two of four. And I am watching the clock, just so you know. <laughs> All these paragraphs looking at you. So, what we have here, and I'm going to try to get through this as much as possible. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this, okay? I did something dangerous, a little bit dangerous, I think, in my mind. I looked at the Word of God, but I was so interested in what the other arguments said, that is the argument of evolution, with the, with the Word of God still in my mind, I didn't leave the Word of God, I went through Wikipedia and I researched every single, everything I possibly could about the traditional theory of evolution. The ages, the millions of years ago, I went through all the minutiae, I combed through it in detail, I wrote it down on paper. Uh, I didn't write it down on paper, I wrote it on Excel, but you get the idea. But I t- kept a record, record of what, what do people mean by when they say evolution. And so I got deep into it. In the course of that, I, asked, I said something in my mind, and this goes back to like, before I was saved, I, I had this germinating in my mind, even in junior high. Uh, I, I know this, all this stuff is coming at me, but I know something in the back of my mind says, they don't know everything, and there's some things that they're not taking into consideration. What you have here on your sheet in the small font, now if you ever have some time, read all of it. I would urge you to read the whole thing. But that, that stuff in small font, that is basically the mysteries of the universe that the evolutionists and the scientists cannot figure out. And just to, to kind of give you a little brain teaser, um, did you know that we have a rectangular galaxy in the universe? A rectangular galaxy, let me say that louder. We have a rectangular galaxy in the universe. It has little beveled edges. It does have rounded edges, but you can look it up. It's uh, LEDA 74886, and it's rectangular in shape. How is it that we have a rectangular galaxy in the universe? That's just wonky. (laughs) 
uh, and you're going to find out there's a lot of more wonky stuff. Am I using that word correctly? Um, there's a lot more wonky stuff out there. That's this one. What I want to begin here with, and this will help us go, and I don't know if I'm going to cover everything here, but we want to look at our universe cleanly and clearly through a biblical lens. And this is going back to the Bible. I was kind of veering off there for a minute, but I want to go back to the Bible and uh, let us understand these things. Uh, I have there in the preface, these are my own words, uh, biblical creationism is not only about giving glory to God for his orderly and beautiful cre- creation found in Genesis 1 and 2. That's what we read earlier. It in- also involves three other things, and these are all straight from the word of God as well. Number one, are admitting when God has us stumped. Uh, this is John Sabo speaking just here for a second. I believe that God receives the glory when scientists look at something and they go, oh, we've got to start all over again. We've got, st- we got, we got to start from ground zero and work our way up all over again. I thought it was this way, and now it's that way. I think God receives the glory when, when professors and scientists have to do that. It, it, they have to do the double take, and they say, I thought it was this way, but now it's this way. And, oh, boy, we have twice as much. We have three times as much as work on our hands. That's because God is bigger than his universe and he can constantly stump the professor. Number two, I believe that biblical creationism also involves the horror of the extent of the fall, as in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 4, the first offspring of Adam was a murderer. That is Cain, who killed his own brother. Familiacide in, in just the beginning chapters of Genesis. The horror at the extent of the fall. How far did we fall? Well, the Bible declares that the whole universe, all of the, co- the cosmos, is, is worn, wearing out and, and crying out for redemption. The whole world is. That's from Romans chapter 8. Number three, our engagement with his mastery, God's mastery over time and space. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. It's a familiar psalm that I think some of you might have memorized early on in your life, perhaps. God is not content with him just running the show. He actually puts us in the mix and has us uh, put our hands to the plow and start get working at the stuff that he put in place. And I love this. This shows you the opposite of deism, which is the the God who is attentive to his own created order, 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 even his own people. It says in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, The psalmist says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. I'm going to stop there at verse 6. That is a God who basically is sovereign. Well, he's not basically, literally fully sovereign over time and space. And on top of that, he says, you're there, you're there, you're there. I'm going to take you, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to put you in this time slot. And you're going to do this. And I'm going to be sovereign over it, and you're going to know my name. That's how sovereign he is. That's how close he is, by the way. He's very close. And he, he has us engaged in his mastery over time and space, his sovereign order. It's a beautiful picture. You even see that in Revelation chapter 1, verse uh, 8, talking about Jesus Christ, who is the what? The Alpha and the Omega, the bookends of time. Jesus Christ is that. And we are in his universe. Uh, Looking at the top there, uh, uh, this is not astrology, it is astronomy. Two words we often get mixed up. Astrology has to do with the dark arts. Astronomy has to do with the dark arts, but it involves evolutionists. <laughs> I'm just joking here. That's a little John joke. But astronomy is the scientific stuff, objective, right? Okay. Um, turn in your Bibles back to Genesis chapter 15. Uh, Genesis chapter 15. And most of you know the story of Abraham in your Bibles, the story of Abraham. Uh, was Abraham a young man or was he an old man? Can you answer, answer that question? Softball. When we are really introduced to him, mostly when we're really, he's older, right? Okay, he's so old, and his wife is so old, they're thinking, uh, we're beyond the age of having children. Uh, wife is barren, Sarai is barren. Uh, Abraham is given this promise that you're going to have a long line of sons and daughters. The whole nation is going to come from your loins. Abraham is thinking, how is that possible? Because I'm so old, and my wife is so old. 
uh, were beyond the age of bearing children. And the Lord says something amazing. He says, uh, you will have kids, and they're going to be, uh, it's going to be more than you can handle. We're talking about a whole dynasty. We're talking about a whole nation coming from your loins, Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. The Lord does something just to kind of help Abraham. As Abraham walks by faith, the Lord helps him continue to walk by faith. The Lord gives, him, gives Abraham his heavenly promises. Verse 5, the Lord brought Abraham uh, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Now here's the question. Uh, it's too bad that you know, Abraham had to wait for billions and billions of years from that light from the, the far side of the universe to get to his eye because we know it takes so long for light to travel across the universe, right? Unless, of course, God can speed it up. Like God slowed down, uh, God slowed down the sun in Joshua chapter 10, verse 12. He can also speed up light as well. He created light, by the way, just so you know, as we know. Um, so that's Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Yes. It's not, it's not consistent through it. There are ebbs and flows. Yeah. So it's going through a root Right. There, right. It's, it's, it's not, um, uh, the constants that they thought about the speed of light are not uh, as constant. They, they know that now, right? So that's another, that's another wrinkle. That doesn't alleviate the problem, but that is another wrinkle. Well, well said. Turn your Bibles also to uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Genesis 22, 17. We talked about the light from the stars and how long it takes to, to get to the, the naked eye. What about, uh, what about the sand? S same promise in a different form. God speaking to Abraham, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens and also as the sand that is on the seashore. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad that God had to wait millions and millions of years for rock to turn into little granules of sand so that Abraham could understand that God is talking about that sand, not pebbles, not big boulders, but little, little. So for that to happen, God had to wait for millions of years to pass for rock to erode into sand, Right. Well, you could say, well, he's, God is sovereign. God doesn't have to wait that long for things to start up. I mean, again, think of the drill sergeant analogy. Does this drill sergeant just wait around and go like, I wish somebody would start to get to work today? No. He's like, today, people, today. And God is just as much proactive. Uh, God does not have to wait millions of years for rock to become sand. God does not have to wait for billions of years for to light to go across the universe so that Abraham could see how big his family is going to be. And he doesn't He's not left thinking it's going to be a couple of little trinkly little stars that made the light already to his eye. But the rest of the stars are way out there in darkness because the light has not traveled yet. Uh, God does not have to wait that long for any of that. God can stop time and God can also speed it up because God is who he is. He's the creator and owner and worker of the universe. Astronomy as well, too. The moon. Uh, he, now, these are some brain teasers. How, many, how much time do I have for this? Eh, about 10 minutes. I think I can get through all this. The moon. Okay, we're going to go through the. We're going to go through all these. Okay, the moon. How did it get there? How did it get there? If, you know, when I look at the moon, what I notice is that it is so round. You notice that it's not like clumped on one side. It doesn't like. Oh, too bad for that crater that dips in and then comes out the other side. It's so perfectly, not perfectly, but pretty round. And I look at the other planets as well too, and. Not bad. They're pretty round. I like smooth things that are round. You know, that, that's nice. You know, they're very aerodynamic and all that good stuff. Wow, how'd that happen? How'd the moon get there? If according to evolution, the moon crashed into the earth, the gravitational spool, pull made it spin around and things kind of worked themselves out that way, why did not earth stay, uh, get punched out of orbit? Why did not the moon, which is smaller? I think it's uh, the diameter of the moon is uh, divided by four of the Earth, why did the moon not get punched out of orbit if they collided? We don't know. <laughs> well, that's a colossal problem, uh, just trying to figure out the moon. 
There's bewildering stuff that is beyond us. Uh, this, this, again, makes the scientists, when they put up the Hubble telescope, they found out that there were two trillion galaxies, not stars, two trillion galaxies in outer space. You want to know the count of the stars? This is just the ones, the ones that we can see, not the ones that we can't see, just what the Hubble telescope can see. The count of stars is if you took every granule of sand on the seashore and on the desert and multiply it by 10, that's how many stars are in the sky. That's, that's, just, that's just bewildering. That's bewildering stuff. We're besides ourselves. There is strange stuff in the universe as well, too, and I'm just taking the scientists, their word for it here. But this is something that makes you shake your head and say, you know, uh, I was not there when this happened, like it says in Job chapter 38. Where were you when I set everything in order? Well, I was not there, and this stuff that I'm seeing now is beyond me. I don't know how many of you have heard of dark matter. How many of you have heard of dark matter? You know that word dark is just a placeholder. It does not mean the color dark. It's just a placeholder. So you could call it something matter. Same thing with dark energy. You could call it something energy instead of dark energy. It's not a color. It's just a placeholder. I wanted to know what dark matter was because everybody's talking about it. Everybody's saying this is the key to evolution and all this. Kind of stuff. Actually, it causes more problems than it does a solution. Dark matter, if you really research it, it is basically the... Uh, people who look at the stars, they notice when they're looking at a galaxy, a galaxy, a galaxy spins around a center. And you would expect, when you see a galaxy with stars and everything spinning around a center, you would think that the ones on the inside of the circle would go, what, faster or slower? Faster, because it's a shorter distance. Same, same thing if you go, you know, if you run track and cross country, or you run around the run around the track. You know, the guy who has the inside has the advantage. Of course, they, they split it up so that it's all fair and even, you know. But yeah, if you, you've all started on the same line, on the same parallel line, then uh, the guy on the inside, when he goes around, uh, he would win the race all the time. The guy on the outside would be going, <laughs> you know, like this, trying to catch up. So they're, they're expecting that when they look into the stars and they see the galaxies, they see these things spinning around a center, that the ones on the center will go faster. And the ones on the outsider, they're just kind of slowing down. They're kind of being worn down. You know what they see? Sort of the opposite, which they can't understand. They see the outer rings going faster of those stars, almost catching up, almost you know, at the same pace of the inner ring stars of the galaxies. And that's for, I think, something like 95% of the universe is that way. They can't explain that. It's not normal. Here are other things that are not normal for you. Uh, dark energy is not normal, where the universe appears to have an elastic quality. It appears to be expanding uh, while, we're, while we're here at a high rate. The rectangular galaxy of Leda 74886, I talked about that already, Venus and Uranus, the two planets, uh, run in opposite direction of our six other planets. That's wonky. That's just weird. You know, when, when, I, you know, when I send something down the drain, everything going down the drain goes like this. Nothing goes, I want to go in this direction. Me too. No, it doesn't work that way. But it does way, that's actually our solar system, has two planets that do that. We only see the smooth side of the moon. On the other side of the moon, it looks horrible. There's these big, giant craters that look, you would look at the moon and go like, ugh, gross. But when we look at the moon, we always get the smooth side. Isn't that nice? Isn't that sweet? God would do that for us. Uh, you would have a cruddy-looking night light at, to look at at, at night. At. What about geology, coming down to geo the subject matter of geology? Again, God did not have to wait millions of years for rock to erode into sand for Abraham to visibly understand how big his family was going to be. God could speed up uh, the erosion of rock. The rocks. Um, I'm going to just come out with maybe a little, little bit of a controversial argument. I usually uh, default on uh, the, the rocks were eroded by the global flood. Just so you know, there is nothing in Scripture that says you have to say that all the time. You could easily say that God layered up rock, you know, like the Grand Canyon, if he wanted to, just for our visible enjoyment. So, you know, when you ever see rock, sometimes you see texture, you see layers of color. There's one photograph I looked at, and there was all this earth shoved up, 
And it was beautiful. It was like all these different, you know, angles of rock and things like this. And some people try to reduplicate that when they do an interior of a house or a coffee table. They give it the weathered look, you know, and that sort of thing. What if God was to do that with regards to his creation? Now, I go, often I go back, you know, to the global flood and say that would help us immensely if we just got our arms around the, the global flood. But God could do other things that, again, are a little bit wonky, are a little bit like that rectangular, rectangular galaxy Lita 74886. Good question to ask as well, too, if all these things are going on, is the, is the rock, in, in fact, a, a reliable time capsule for everything that we see in the evolutionary scheme? And I would say no, because things are changing so rapidly in their timeline. Look at page three of four in your outline as well, too, looking at the continents. Again, this is John Sabo looking at all the facts, sifting through them, and I have questions. <laughs> I have some pretty, pretty hard questions here. Okay, most of you have heard, and I, I believe it's true myself, that at the beginning of time, all the continents were shoved together. Do you all believe that? How many people believe that the continents were all one mass? Um, how deep is our ocean, by the way? Depth of ocean? Two miles. In some places, the Mariana Trench, is, Mariana Trench is, I think, five or eight miles. Most of it, if you go past eight miles, I think you hit hot rock and it gets really hot underneath. But it's, it's usually the ocean is two miles deep. So here's my, here's my issue, tectonic plates. Now, I'm an engineer, and I deal with this because I deal with seismic activity, like right outside our door, um, with regards to uh, tidal waves and things like that, with regards to earthquakes and tsunamis. Um, tectonic plates, you know, there's about seven or 12 of them. They, they move at a rate of about two inches per year. Um, and how they move is, in the Atlantic, it's said that they move apart. We can kind of see this now. They move apart in the middle of the Atlantic. And then on the opposite side is the Pacific Ocean, and they're shoved together in Japan. In Japan, they have what's called subduction. It's where the, the crust goes like a hangnail into uh, the mantle, I mean, into the bottom part there. So it's basically saying that the tectonic plates work on, I'm going to use just a, a regular term, conveyor belts. So you can imagine all these conveyor belts going round, 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 and, and everything's moving. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, if you want to say that, that's fine. It's okay. But uh, how does that work exactly mechanically? Because if I had all this massive amount of rock, and it's miles deep, mind you, and I shove it into the earth, uh, and, and you, you're making a gap that's not like a little crevice here. It's the Atlantic Ocean, folks. <laughs> it's this wide. <laughs> okay, here's, here's Africa, here's South America. That's a wide amount of distance. There's no streaking land masses that we can detect going diagonally between them. Uh, I don't even think we have, an, we might have a couple of islands in between them, but they're shoved apart. I just want to say, it looks pretty clean, you know? It, 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 if it happened naturalistically, it should look like crud, and we should have all these stuff shoved up into uh, beyond the highest mountain, shoved up, and then shoved down. And things, it's just like if you, for those of you guys who work on your car, if you all saw all these you know, things rotating, and let's just say you threw a, a wrench in there. What happens? <laughs> it just stops. Nobody asked this question. Why do this, why, why do you, when you have subduction, why do your plates don't go like this, and then it's a massive explosion of matter. Nobody wants to answer that question. That is why the tectonic plate theory, I believe, is called a theory. It is not a law. We observe some qualities of the tectonic plate theory, but it is not a law. God could have been doing something else. There's maybe some other things that are going on. So when people place all their faith on rocks, I'm going to bring up the tectonic plate again theory. Some wonky stuff. By the way, how does the fossils, if it goes underneath the earth, how does it get back up again so that we can, we can locate it? How does that happen? It went underneath a conveyor belt into the heat, the heap, the hot part of the earth, and then it comes back up again so that we can see it? How does that work? I, I, you know, that's beyond me. Um, biology. Um, you heard this. Greg brought this up. Is the Cambrian explosion. If you want to look up, this is not a young earth creationist. This is an old earth creationist. His name is Stephen Meyer. Look up some YouTube videos on Stephen Meyer. He will point out with the Cambrian explosion, we have a massive, massive problem 
with regards to all this life, complex alien looking life like, like horseshoe crab things and other things that are spiny and weird at the bottom of the seafloor and they're, they're, they're embedded in rock that is way below us uh, saying that they're much older but they're complex and they, we can't find their ancestors. We should find like half formed things behind them or lower to them but we can't. They just are there <laughs> in the rock, in old rock, mind you. That is called the Cambrian Explosion. And Stephen, or Stephen Meyer will talk more about that on YouTube videos. What about microscopic wars? This is the extension, I believe, of the fall. When the fall happened, when Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered into the world and there was all this uh, disease. The ground got super hard and all these other things happened. You can look at, uh, on YouTube videos about microscopic microscopic wars, uh, cannibal cannibalistic wars going on at the microscopic level with regards to plankton and uh, viruses attacking cells. Chimpanzee DNA, uh, that's something you can research on your own. And uh, this is where a lot of uh, theistic evolutionists like BioLogos, that organization, they champion this as the reason why you should believe in theistic evolution. They say, did you not know? Oh, this is gonna disturb your faith so much you're gonna break down. But don't, just stay with us and stay faithful. But the chimpanzee and the human beings have approximately the same DNA. They don't completely, in fact, one strand is separated and the other one is together, but the other DNA is very much the same. Okay, then people go like, well, I guess I, guess I came from a chimp, you know, because they said I came from a chimp and they got the DNA going for them. The thing that they don't share, I think, and they, I think they could share a little bit more wisely, is that there are other animals that can, uh, that have different DNA that can interbreed and create basically a new species. If you ever, how many of you have heard of a mule before? Okay, a mule is a, a what and a what? Yeah, a, a hybrid of a donkey and a horse, all right. Uh, a, a lion can uh, come together with a tiger and produce a half-breed or hybrid. Uh, I'm not trying to be gross or anything, but we cannot do that with chimpanzees. I don't, want to, I don't want to be gross, but we cannot do that with chimpanzees. There are other animals that have very different DNA strands. They can come together and have offspring, even though they are of different species and they have different DNA strands. Totally different, radically different, and they can have offspring. And yet humans cannot do the same, even though we have the same, not the same, but similar uh, DNA strands of chimpanzees. By the way, God can do anything he wants to. If he wants to make his signature here the same way he makes his signature over there, he can do that. He's sovereign. But I just want to share with you that, that sometimes we don't look at the full picture. Another thing to consider here is the intelligence factor as well, too. Uh, how many chimps does it take to change a light bulb? Well, if you train it right, one, right? You might have to do this <laughs> instead of this. How many chimps does it take to invent a light bulb? Oh, that's a different question. Well, wait a second. I'm still staying in, I'm staying in science. How many chimps does it take to invent a light bulb? Well, wait a second. Wait a second. We were talking about layers of inventions before that and all this kind of stuff. Well, wait a second. We're just talking about the human brain here and how things connect with the human brain. Oh, we have a problem. We have a massive abyss a massive chasm between the intelligence of a chimp and the ch intelligence of human beings. Uh, you have other things here that you can read on your own, the whole area of the social sciences. There's a lot of young people today are saying, I don't know why we can't get along and I don't know why we have to work. That's two questions young people ask today. Number one, why do I have to work? I want a future where I don't have to work at all. And sometimes old people want that as well, too. I want a future where I do not have to work at all, even though God gave us six days of work and one day of rest. Uh, another question they say, why do we not get along? Why, why is mom and dad always not getting along? Why, why is this new wedding or this new marriage that I'm having uh, going uh, all over the place? The Bible in Genesis, minds you, gives you the answer to those questions. It talks about Eve uh, getting a curse put upon her where her husband would be uh, domineering, and she would always fight for her, her husband's position as head. And the only relief you have for that, by the way, is Ephesians chapter 5, where it says, wives, submit to your husbands, and husbands, be like a humble king, a humble king to your wife. That means where you lay down your life for her as you lead her. 
So the Bible gives the answer. You just have to keep on reading. It does give you the problem of the curse, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, but it also gives the solution, which is uh, new life in Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 5. What about men working hard jobs to the point of dying and expiring to the point of death? That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Uh, it says, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. And it almost says it like this, <laughs> to the point you die, face down in the ground. That's in the Bible. Um, but there's relief to that as well, too, as you look at Christ and you, re- you depend on the Lord and you see his new kingdom coming along its way. Turn to the back of your outline, and I'm just going to whiz through this really quickly. I know people are coming through the door wondering what's going on. But uh, part three of your outline on page four of four, where do we go from here? You can read this on your own. I believe that we should expose evolution as an actual state religion. Uh, That is because it doesn't just talk about our origins. It talks about where we should be going as well. It plans that all all out for young minds. Number two, bring Christian linear logic back to academia. We do that a little bit already in Christian schools, but we could do it some more. Number three, teach both the historic fall and the, the work of the heavenly savior, Christ being the answer for all this. So many young people today, they're thinking that technology is the answer, this thing that I have in my pocket, this thing. This will save my soul. Old people think that their 401k will save their soul. If you have a good pension pro- program, that will save your soul. No, it will not save your soul. You will come a time when you have to face before a holy God, and this, my gadget, will not save me. No, it doesn't matter how complex and how wonderful it is, this will not save my soul. If I have a pension program or something like that, lots of government money, that will not save my soul. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ that will make everything right before God, and his blood is shed for us if we put our faith in him. So that's what the, the, the tall order is. There is a, a, a fallacy, I think, with all this. I would admit that I am, I am easily drawn to this as just saying, let's just make it all uh, you know, Christian university. Let's turn this whole church into a Christian university and have young people come in and be trained and all this kind of stuff. And thinking it's just about head knowledge. It's not just about head knowledge. It's about the heart being circumcised from the inside out. And that only happens through Jesus Christ coming in and, and, and doing business. God doing business through his son in our hearts. So I want to end on that. I'm going to close in prayer. Thank you for listening. And uh, you can read the rest on your own. Our Heavenly Father, we want to come before you right now. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for this time. Uh, Lord, we pray, Father, that we would... Uh, uh, Stay faithful, Lord, even amid, amid all wars and, and battles that we fight, Lord. Uh, thoughts come into our minds that weigh in on us and try to grip our hearts away from our Lord and our faithfulness to Christ. We pray, O oh Father, that you would help us uh, to contend for the faith to the very end and to remain strong in the things of your word and not to veer for, to the left and not to veer to the right, but to go on the straight and narrow path of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all this in your name. Amen.